I'm going to talk fast and try to make some points. And I want to up front say somewhat of an apology for starting out in a gloomy way. I know this has been an upbeat day, and I just heard the last speaker who did an incredible job. But I want to promise you, I won't end in a gloomy way. And really, gloomy may not be the right word. I would put it in terms of a fundamental challenge, which is what I want us for a few minutes to focus on. What I would argue to this room is the fundamental challenge to the future of moral progress for the region. And let me be clear, when I say moral progress, I mean a definition of morality that we can all agree upon, a large enough def definition that embraces all of our backgrounds and traditions of belief, defined, I would say, most generally as an expectation and a desire on the part of all of us to continue what could only be called a transcendent trajectory of progress in this nation since its inception, where realistically you can have families who care about their communities and focus on raising their children well and have integrity in the workplace, that they can realistically believe that their children will realize a better life than they did in a range of different ways and so forth and so on for their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. What I would suggest to you all is no longer is that trajectory no, not just in, it's no longer inevitable, it's almost inevitably not going to take place unless there's a fundamental redefinition of what it means to be an adult, ethical, engaged citizen. In other words, after World War II, there literally were a few decades where there was room for freeloaders in terms of civic obligation. As long as you didn't break the laws, you were okay to your family. The country, literally speaking, didn't need that much more from that many people. That economic reality is no longer there. That window of opportunity for freeloading is gone. And for us moving forward, the ultimate requirement of progress in any area that any of us care about, especially domestic policy, is a redefined civic obligation. And when you look back 30 years, you see for most demographics a reversal of civic engagement what a lot of people call civic devolution, civic withdrawal. Some of you are familiar with Robert Putnam, who's one of the best known scholars in the area of citizenship engagement, and there's been a, a plethora of researchers and scholarship following him over the last 10 years, addressing this pointed concern for the nation. Over the last 30 to 40 years, Americans organizing less, participating in groups and associations and movements in lower rates, everywhere from Rotary, Kiwanis, Lions Clubs, to PTA, which when done well has a transformative impact on schools. Boys and Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Clubs, 4-H, anyone here from rural backgrounds know the value of that when it's done well. Everything I've just named to you has dramatically declined in participation in relation to the population over the last 30 years. And you think through that and you think, well, have we just gotten bad at being good Americans? It, no. Without a lot of complex analysis, you see that pretty easily you understand that the reason dramatically fewer mothers are showing up at their schools for PTA meetings in the late afternoon or early evening is not because they don't care about their children. It's because the vast majority of them need to work every hour they can find to support their family at a level that many of our grandfathers wouldn't have been able to manage alone on one income two generations ago, and usually just with a high school diploma. Clearly no longer the case. One of the biggest pressures of our ability to engage in causes and visions beyond our own family's interest is just time pressure from an increasingly complicated economy that requires more and more of us to work more and more hours. There's a civic consequence to that, especially for women who in a very short period of time have poured into the workforce, starting in the late 60s and early 70s, into the 80s, tens of millions, and to the point we're at now, which is at equal levels to men, almost, working every hour they can find. And not for luxury goods or a second home, but for most of them to barely get by with less savings than any time in our nation's history, with more debt than any time in our nation's history. That puts pressure on our ability to think collectively and creatively to improve communities. When you add to that, to me, the most fascinating 30-year trend, not just people working longer hours, but where people choose to live. 15 years ago, some of you have heard me say this, a fascinatingly important marker in our country's cultural evolution. 15 years ago was the first point at which a majority of us now live in the suburbs. 
And when we think about the giant of Birmingham, when we think about the progress of Birmingham, I think it would be fundamentally flawed for us to think about just people living in Birmingham. Certainly we all agree that when someone from Vestavia is visiting family in California and they get asked where they're from, they should damn well say Birmingham. This is a region that falls or rises together. And increasingly, at least economically, most suburbanites increasingly realize that. But it's important to consider what it means to our civic health as a city, considering what's happened in terms of demographics. Shelby County is the 11th fastest growing county in the country. As more and more Americans, including Alabamians, push further and further into the suburbs, that impacts our ability to be thoughtfully engaged in improving communities. First, because, like work, it requires a lot of damn time. The average commute of Americans continues to go up. More Americans are still willing to spend more time in the car to realize what they believe to be the American dream. Better schools, safer streets, pretty neighborhoods. But more than that, it's not a shock to you all to hear that suburbanization leads to increased homogeneity. When you drive into new housing developments in Shelby County or outside of Trustful, you see not a million dollar house next to a hundred thousand dollar house next to a three. You see houses that are about the same amount of money, usually the same builder, and unfortunately for us all aesthetically, sometimes it's the same damn house with a different marble top. You can choose the red marble or this. You want the shutters on this side of the garage or that side of the garage. And as we've seen this suburbanization spread over the map of America, more and more Americans are living and isolating themselves relationship-wise as well with people who make about the same amount of money, who live the same type of life, and most importantly, who share the same worldviews. And they're spending more and more time on the interstate systems, whether it's 280 or 65 down to Montgomery or out toward Tuscaloosa, and less time, and this is the fundamental point for my argument to you all, is the challenge of our lifetime, is that an increasing percentage of Alabamians are spending less personal connected time with people unlike themselves aimed at projects and goals beyond their own family's immediate needs than ever before. And I can address college students around the state and explain the fundamental importance of being the wealthiest, most industrialized, technologically advanced nation in the history of the world with 20% of the adult population in the South functionally illiterate. I can tell them there are 11 million children still without health insurance, and the vast majority of small children in our state don't see pediatricians regularly. And if they're being thoughtful, they'll memorize what I'm saying. But if that's all they know about those children, if that's all they know about the 20% of the adult population who literally can't read in their adult lives, they're not going to be very helpful at creatively participating in improving the problems. Because it turns out that to be good at improving the lives of other human beings requires connectedness. Compassion is not just an intellectual exercise. It requires, at the DNA level, personal, visceral connections with other human beings. That's the challenge of an increasingly competitive world economy and a suburbanization and work hours that makes it harder for us to have time to connect with people unlike ourselves because that's the DNA of moral progress. Now you're all thinking, gosh, I was feeling good until this guy got up there. It's important to see the other side of that point, which is it's in our DNA to care about other human beings if we are, in fact, connected. It becomes less of a convincing argument to make when there are connections there. It turns out that for the vast majority of citizens, the mass, vast majority of human beings, regardless of ideology, care about the condition of other human beings when they're viscerally put in a position to know it. And it turns out Universities across the state and the nation for the last decade have been taking more seriously the challenge to deal with a generation of 18-year-olds, whether they come from rural, urban, or suburban, realizing that most of them are coming to campus with very few connections beyond their own demographic background. And to take seriously the idea that to graduate with a degree in higher education in Alabama doesn't just mean you have the tools to make money in the future. By the time you're done with your sophomore year, you're better educated than 79% of the state. And I don't think it's wrong to suggest to that demographic that additional obligations come with the opportunities that education affords you. And in particular, to grow the pipeline for students younger than you. Because as optimistic as I am, I can tell you standing here right now with certainty that the majority of people in Alabama under the age of 16 will not be going to college. 
that's already in stone. And I believe it's immoral not to think into the future, ahead to future generations. Now that comes to this meeting, to this day, to the possibility of the future. We have a lot more to build on in Birmingham just for hopeful language from accomplishments and victories in the past or the idea of being better in the future. Right now, there are transformative, transcendent projects going on in our community. There's not one place in the country that you can point to 22 universities partnered together with an initiative that provides high-tech vision care to low-income two, three, and four-year-olds like we do in Alabama. And I'll tell you briefly, we've had 2,200 college students trained to use this $4,000 camera that takes pictures of children's eyes. The reason this is important, one fundamental betrayal of a healthcare system in our country is vision care. It turns out that about 10% of us need glasses to see well enough to read. Unfortunately, that happens to most children by the age of two. There's not a state in the country that comprehensively provides vision care until children get to public school. The reason being, it's expensive to get to them. Before their school age, you have to go in smaller numbers. It's a hard equation to make work. But what if you tap in to the generous spirit and nature of college students and partner with professors and university administrations to make it a concerted effort, not just on an occasional afternoon or for a season, but indefinitely moving into the future? This will be, from this point forward, our obligation. The first year, we partnered with seven campuses seven years ago and screened 4,600 small children in low-income daycares. We have a partner that provides follow-up care for every problem that comes up, free. This last year, we screened 34,000 two, three, and four-year-olds in all 67 counties of Alabama. Partnering with 22 campuses, leading hundreds of college students on these screenings. And when I say leading, I didn't do any screening. We have 30 full-time employees at Impact Alabama, 350 applications from around the country to come take these positions, which pay $1,000 a month. And someone mentioned to me, I mean, this recession must be really helping you guys. You're completely missing the point. We don't get staff members who were trying to get a job at Bank of America and it didn't work out, so now they're going to do vision care. <laughs> They've been focused in on this for the last several years an aspirational sense of wanting their adult life, not just an occasional volunteering afternoon, but wanting the core of their adult life to be focused around making the difference in a fundamental way for other human beings. The average GPA of this $1,000 a month staff this year in Alabama is over a 375. Literally, I couldn't get a job at my own organization. I'm very fortunate I started it because I wouldn't hire myself. <laughs> 34,000 small children. There's not an initiative anywhere in the country like this. The whole damn thing is run and executed by people under the age of 22. Because we have among us 19 and 20 and 21-year-olds who will wake themselves up at 5.30 in the morning and go pick up that camera and drive to a daycare center down a dirt road in Greene County that you can't find on MapQuest because they know in their gut and they believe in their core that those children deserve medical care too. And it's not okay just to complain about it and protest about it when you have the ability to do something about it. That's at the core of our higher education collaboration. We also have a tax initiative that is similarly situated. This is one example among many. This potential is here, what a lot of people refer to as the Teach for America generation. Let's be clear about that. Teach for America is in Alabama now. It's not the end-all, be-all to solve the ills of public education, but it's more than just the service the teachers provide, which is incredible and proven without a shadow of a doubt the value of it. It's also a symbol of this generational shift. It's not politically correct to say this, but one of the problems with public education teaching is that by the late 80s, as women had options open up before them they didn't have in the 50s, like law, business, medicine, the caliber of teaching young people interested in teaching dropped. To the point in the late 80s, the average GPA of students going into schools of education was a C minus. Sort of a throwaway career if you can't get into something else. You start hearing comments back for young people who are interested in teaching, an older person would say, isn't that cute? I mean, that's sweet. You're really good with, there's nothing sweet about this. There's nothing cute about education. This is the most important career choice in America. And by the late 80s, it was thought of as one of the lowest prestige level careers, which leveled off through the 90s and in the last decade has skyrocketed up to where it is now, which is where it, exactly where it deserves to be. An aspirational career choice to consider among people who have every other option in front of them, but happen to be choosing for however many years to dedicate themselves to the education of children, regardless of background or class or race. 
the fundamental principle that makes Teach for America work, the fundamental culture that makes Impact Alabama reality, is the seedbed and tradition and story of Birmingham. When we started the Civil Rights Institute, there was a lot of people who thought it was a bad idea. Why do you want to bring up old wounds? Why do you want to rehash this? And Odessa Wolfolk, one of the people I consider a godmother to the city, appropriately articulated to the community, no, 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 it's not opening up old wounds. For everyone, regardless of race or class, it's a celebration of what's possible when you couple hope with courage, with work, with a vision, with faith. It's a celebration for all of us, and it's a strength to build upon. And we have a strong legacy to fulfill here. And every one of us has to answer that question individually. What does it mean for me? Where is my niche going to be to have a transformative impact on other human beings? It used to be eight years ago I would get teased by former law student classmates about choosing Birmingham, choosing to leave the practice of law to do what I'm doing. No one teases me anymore. That culture has shifted around the country, and people get it more and more. The last thing I would say is the head of our community foundation met 15 of our staff members last year, and she said after they left the room, they're so impressive. Do you think they're just here because they feel bad for Alabama? I said, no, no, no. There are poor children without vision care. There are poor families that need tax help all over the country. They don't have a platform to do anything about it anywhere else other than Birmingham this way. They're here because of the platform we give them to have a transformative impact. There are poor kids everywhere. They're coming here because of the culture of doing something about it. Thank you all for having me.